reasonably well recovered. Um, okay, so, um, so last time we discussed the possible implications of biotechnology and other advances for human health. We talked a little bit about genetic engineering, nanotechnology, things like that that might foreshadow perhaps a fifth stage to the health transition, an idea we introduced now many weeks ago at the beginning of the class. We talked a little bit about the debate between Sandel and Harris. Uh, and sort of concluded, at least I concluded, that Sandel's argument really didn't hold much water in the face of Harris's uh, criticism, but you, of course, can make up your own minds. We alluded a little bit to Hughes's argument about the hand-in-hand -hand nature of technological development and democratic processes, and how these in some way are parallel and interdigitating forces that are important to the advancement of health in the current era. Uh, we talked a little bit about the practical and moral problems raised by situations at the boundary, things that are sort of in between, which is a classic focus, for example, in anthropology, things between life and death, between humans and machines, between humans and animals, and so forth. And today, I'm going to be continuing our conversation to talk a little bit about the sort of policy and, to a lesser extent, moral issues that are related to the social determinants of health. And I'm going to discuss initially whether people have insurance in the United States and whether that even matters. And also, I'll introduce towards the latter half of the lecture a variety of kind of a potpourri of policy interventions that we might implement, including allusions to the book Nudge, which was assigned uh, for today. Now, before, however, doing that, I just want to highlight a couple of other announcements. First of all, uh, tomorrow, uh, Renee Fox is going to be visiting and is going to be speaking about medical humanitarianism. This will be at the, uh, actually physically being hosted at the Yale Institute for Network Science on Hill House on the third floor, but she's a visitor to other parts of the university. I know her very well. She was actually my dissertation advisor, and she just completed an extraordinary book on medical humanitarianism. She's in her 80s but her mind is still on fire, and she has very interesting things to say. Those of you that are interested in global health, medical humanitarianism, doctors of the world, doctors without borders, and so forth, she'll be speaking from 3 to 4.30 uh, up the street tomorrow. You're all welcome. Also, I want to mention those of you that are, are in Silliman, or those of you that are interested in tweeting or following colleges, we're kind of resurrecting the Silliman Twitter feed. So if you'd like to follow us, yes. So if you'd like to follow, it's Silliman2, uh, and you can sort of see we're trying to up our game there. Now, uh, here are the results, another administrative thing. Here are the results of the midterm. You guys did really well, actually, on the midterm. I Obviously, you, you applied yourselves. I was very impressed. The average was 90.2 with a standard deviation of 7, and the median was 92 uh, on this midterm. So that was uh, dramatic and made me happy that you're learning and paying attention. Okay, oh, and then another administrative thing before we get into the other stuff. So this is just, again, reorienting you to the procedures for the final. I, I hate being so bureaucratic and doctrinaire about these things, but because we have to grade 180 15-page finals in, in seven days, uh, we just have lots of specific expectations. This is an open book, open note. Uh, you will not require any extra reading nor expect it, uh, but we may assign a one page of reading embedded within one of some of the questions. You need to work on your own. Please don't collaborate with others. Don't plagiarize from others or from sources. It leads to all kinds of unpleasantness. We typically use electronic screening to check for these things. Just don't do it. If you find yourselves desperate, if you're tired, you're lonely, you're distracted by other events in your life, don't just resist the temptation to cut and paste prose. Contact Sam or me, and we will make arrangements given your circumstances, OK? please. Just don't do it. Um, the, it'll be broadly synthetic over, over the, because typically that's when people make bad decisions, right? When they're at their limit, uh, and then they just make a foolish uh, decision. You don't need to do that in this case. Uh, it'll be broadly synthetic of the entire course. It'll be about 12 to 14 pages across two questions, one from each of two triplets uh, you will be asked to answer. And it'll be blindly graded uh, as usual. We're going to post the exam this coming Thursday at 5 o'clock. And you have uh, seven days to return it to us. And we have very specific requirements for how you do this. There's a face sheet that needs to be completed. The face sheet needs to be separate from the two uh, project answers, each of which has to be stapled separately. Please listen to this. Uh, it's essential that you comply exactly, because immediately upon your turning them in, they're going to be disassembled, rooted, graded, come back, and I have to review them, and so forth. 
You need to drop them off between 2.30 and 5 on April the 30th, so seven days. You need to wait till your name is checked off the list, but you don't need to deliver it yourself. So someone else, your roommate or friend, can deliver your exam if you trust them. So if we don't get your exam and your roommate says, I turned it in, we believe ourselves, not your roommate, okay? Uh, and we won't accept exams late. We will also give you an additional drop-off time the day before, Wednesday morning from 9.30 to 11.30, if you prefer, 11, if you prefer that. You have to I load an identical copy of your examination. This does not have to happen by the deadline, but it has to happen, oh no, it does, by the deadline also. <laughs> I think we'll actually keep that open so that those of you that are scrambling to the bitter end and turn in the hard copy can go back to your rooms and then upload it. But you have to upload the electronic copy. Uploading the electronic copy is not a replacement for turning in a hard copy. Um, and uh, email Sam if you have any, uh, if any of this poses a hardship, and again, follow the directions. Any questions about all the mechanics that I've just gone through very quickly and boringly? Prefrosh, have any questions about this? <laughs> okay. So, um, so it's fairly shocking to realize that in a country as rich as ours, and in a country with advanced healthcare technology to the extent that we have it, uh, up to even a few years ago, uh, that is to say the first quarter of 2013, uh, had a significant fraction of Americans who were still uninsured. About 13% or 41 million Americans uh, lacked uh, health insurance. And actually this insurance, it depends on how you quantify it. Sort of, uh, so this is at the time of the interview, any part of the last year, the number goes up. If we say, okay, well, how about in the last year at all? Was there a period of uninsurance? Uh, and what fraction of you are uninsured for more than a year? Uh, it's even higher. And this looks at children in purple under, uh, uh, under 18 and adults who are 18 to 64. Children have lower uninsurance rates because they're often uh, covered by Medicaid or other state level uh, provisions. And this, in fact, is completely different than every other industrialized democracy. And this fact, the fact that we're so aberrant, coupled with a manifest inefficiency, it's not efficient to provide health care in a way in which only some people have insurance and therefore different sorts of access to the system, and inequity in the system prompted the passage of health care reform about four years ago that's finally beginning to make a dent in some of these numbers. And incidentally, it needs to be very clear if you engage in debates with your colleagues, and I hope you will argue in dining halls about all kinds of ideas, not just this idea, or other similar ideas. It's important to realize that, uh, that we've always, at least since the 1960s, have sort of single-payer, government-provided health insurance for anyone older than 65. So that's always been the case, or for 50 years in the United States. So actually, if anything, all of the debate that you may have been reading about when you were in high school under President Obama and everything else was a debate about actually potentially extending a type of healthcare infrastructure and system that we already provide to all the elderly to an earlier age. And this was resisted for a number of mostly political, not actually pragmatic or scientific uh, reasons. And in fact, as I've already mentioned, the United States is very unusual in its lack of public health insurance for all, and actually very backward. All these European countries had compulsory health insurance, some for over 100 years. So for example, Germany for over a century, Austria and Hungary, Luxembourg, Norway, Serbia beat us to the punch by over 100 years. Great Britain, Russia, the Irish Greece, France, Romania, Estonia, Bulgaria, also almost 100 years beat us to it. Portugal, Poland, Austria, etc. So Greece, which, <laughs> Greece beat us to this by almost a century. Latvia, Lithuania, um, and so forth. So most industrialized democracies have had single payer state uh, insurance for health care for an extremely long time. And of course, insurance status varies tremendously by age, and your age range in the audience here is, of course, the healthiest, on average, age range of the population, but also, alarmingly, the most uninsured. And as I was already hinted at the previous slides, people under 18 often have lower uninsurance rates, 5 to 6 percent uninsured, because, of course, they're covered through Medicaid, but then that lapses when they get into college age, and the peak of uninsurance occurs in these sort of early periods, and then there's a sudden drop off again as people enter Medicare and are, are covered there, where less than 2% of the elderly are not covered by, uh, by Medicare uh, insurance. And interestingly, however, most people who lack insurance actually are employed. So the, 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 in, the lack of insurance in our country, amazingly, isn't just the people who don't have jobs. Most of the people who don't have insurance actually have jobs. And so this shows figures from 2012. It looks at, uh, well, is someone in the family 
uh, at least some person working. And there's one or more full-time workers among 63% of the people who lack health insurance. And part-time workers in another, whatever that is, 16%. And only about a fifth of the people who lack insurance also lack jobs. And actually, income is also pretty you know, distributed. Uh, even 10% uh, of people that earn more than 400% uh, or four times the federal poverty line uh, are uh, uninsured. And so people, for example, that have a very poor have higher likelihood of being insured because of Medicaid and other provisions. And it's data like this, the fact that actually a large fraction of people who are uninsured are actually employed, suggests that a policy lever to the policymakers in the federal level that this might be a mechanism by which to deliver health insurance. Now it's actually, if you were designing the system from scratch, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, employment for the pop, uh, you know, people need to have jobs, people need to have insurance, let's mix those two things. Those aren't things which necessarily need or even benefit from going together, as David Cutler argues in a book, in one of his recent books. But, but because so many people are employed who are uninsured, it seemed like a logical way to implement a kind of bureaucracy which allowed us to reach this population. And so that's part of the reason why extending workplace insurance was implemented on the federal level. And a number of solutions to the problem of the lack of insurance have been suggested which include, as I just mentioned, extending workplace insurance, implementing a single-payer system, that is to say, let's try to expand Medicare to cover everyone, down to 18, for example, or provide a public pool with certain kinds of mandatory enrollment. And a single-payer system will lack competition and may have other features, such as bureaucracy and rules and constraints, that might also be problematic. And this was one of the reasons people resisted this idea, at least in the United States, unlike many European countries. On the other hand, as I mentioned, we do have Medicare, which is a single-payer system. Uh, and it seems to work pretty well, actually, in terms of providing access to health care for the elderly. And having a single-payer would make it possible to incentivize quality and to drive down, drive down administrative waste. So a huge fraction of the money we spend, of the many billions of dollars we spend in our country on health care, actually goes to pay not health care providers, but bureaucrats, people who are not providing health care, but people who are processing claims and dealing with the administrative aspects of health care, which, from a rational perspective, is not necessarily the ideal way we should be spending our health care dollars. So one idea that was debated in, in advance of the passage of the ACA Act was to maybe expand Medicare and just push it down to cover uh, younger and younger people. This idea was not, in the end, uh, adopted. And in fact, as I've been alluding to, in 2010, the, uh, the, affordable, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was finally passed and began to address some of these issues. And the act was very complex and reflected a number of political realities. And it wasn't perfect, but it wasn't bad either. It requires citizens and legal immigrants to have insurance, first of all. It creates state-based American health benefit exchanges through which individuals can buy coverage and it has a complex set of incentives to motivate people to participate. It has a so-called individual mandate, which is incentivized by a penalty to try to make people participate. It requires employers to provide coverage, again, with complex incentives and different rules for very small employers compared to bigger employers, again, exploiting the fact that the large majority of uninsured people are actually uh, working. And it expanded Medicaid and Medicare existing systems in certain ways to dragnet and pick up more people who could be given access. And obviously, as you all, I'm sure, appreciate that in order for insurance to work, it has to distribute risk. We don't want only ill people to buy insurance. And we don't want people not to buy insurance, which is typically what happens, and then simply impose their costs on us anyway in all kinds of inefficient ways. So it was very common when I was a house officer at the University of Pennsylvania on the west side that people would be brought in on Saturday nights after what we used to call knife and gun club, and they would be shot or stabbed. And those people were not insured. But we live in a civilized society. We do not let people die when they roll up onto our streets or onto our hospitals, so we care for them. And that often might cost $100,000 to save someone's life in that situation. But that person has no insurance. The hospital, the University of Pennsylvania, where I was at, that provided that care doesn't just produce the money from somewhere, it's distributed inefficiently among all the other people getting care uh, at the hospital. So because I, and I think this is in right in a sense, you know, we, we do not allow hospitals to turn people away who don't have insurance. If you show up at a hospital with a problem, the hospital is required by law to stabilize you. They don't have to provide long-term care, but they can't just lock the doors and let you die on the street, which incidentally used to happen before the passage of such laws. 
And as you saw in your readings, the fraction of uninsured Americans is dropping after the Affordable Care Act. So with the progressive implementation of the law in the last few years, uh, now, or about a year ago, we were down to about 16% of Americans after, you know, beginning in 2012, it was 20, and before that, it was um, even higher. So the population of the uninsured is being and will be far reduced, and the remaining group of uninsured people over the next couple of years will be primarily composed of illegal immigrants, the few people who can't afford their insurance and aren't getting subsidies to help them purchase it, and people who have decided to pay the penalty rather than purchase insurance. So we've actually, the law has meaningfully and substantially expanded insurance coverage in our society, whatever its limitations or design defects. And across incomes and racial and ethnic groups, adults with low incomes and Latinos experience the greatest and largest uh, declines in uninsurance rates. And this is a policy, and probably one of the only policies we've discussed so far in the class, where actually implementing the policy is narrowing, not widening, socioeconomic inequality. So we have a situation now in which actually after this policy, we see a, a smaller difference between ethnic groups uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, the, the gap in coverage. So for example, if you look at whites versus Latinos, it was 16% versus 36% uh, that were uninsured before the implementation of the act, and 12 versus 23% afterwards. So the whites get better, and the Latinos get better, but the Latinos get much better than the whites get, and so you get a narrowing of the racial gap and the ethnic gap in this case, different than many of, and most of the other things we've been discussing uh, throughout the class. And not surprisingly, lacking insurance results in a significant reduction in the use of healthcare. So if you don't have insurance, you don't seek medical care. And so for example, here, if you look at the percentage of adults reporting uh, who are 20 to 29, so roughly your age, who did not get or delayed and needed medical care due to cost, uh, those that have private insurance, maybe about 7 to 10% said, uh, this is across ethnic groups, 7 to 10% said, no, you know, I didn't get the health care I needed because of the cost, compared, unsurprisingly, to the uninsured, where it was closer to 30%. So not having insurance, unsurprisingly, <coughs> interferes with your ability to get medical care even when you uh, need it. And of course, by now, you all know that there could be confounding factors associated both with not having health insurance and with not seeking medical care. So maybe you're just a disorganized, dysfunctional person, and neither do you get medical care, nor do you get organized to get health insurance. So it's not the lack of health insurance that's making you not get uh, the health care. And we're also um, unsure about whether medical care is the crucial determinant of health regardless. So as you've seen throughout the course by now, uh, it's totally unclear, it should be unclear to you, whether medical care really advances um, health, whether actually this is the problem. Maybe all this effort to expand insurance actually didn't improve health uh, in our society. But we still must remember that one of the key things that we've been seeing throughout the course is that access to health care or insurance may not make much of a difference to health at all. Having insurance does increase the use of medical care, as we just saw, and the financial details of the kind of insurance you have influence how much medical care you use. And we know this from a very famous experiment that was done about 30 or so years ago now called the RAND Health Insurance Experiment, actually more, 40 years, which was conducted in the 1970s. And so how, how do we know whether giving someone health insurance affects their health care consumption? First question. Second question is, does that health care consumption improve their health? Two questions. So this experiment looked at that, and another experiment that was in your readings also looked at that. So the first question is answered by this slide. It says, okay, we're going to randomly assign these families to different kinds of insurance plans. In one plan, they're going to get free health care. And in other plans, you're going to have to pay 25%, 50%, or 95% of the cost of their health care. And then we're going to look at how much health care do they consume. And unsurprisingly, the more they have to pay for it, the less they use the doctor. So when the care is free, they get 4.5% visits and on down the list. These are hospital admissions. Also, even hospital admissions, which you might think should be objective. Why, you know, the doctor should admit you to the hospital based on your illness, based on your biological factors, not based on social factors, you would think. I hope no longer by this time in the course, recognizing as you must, that social factors are as important, if not more important, in determining healthcare use and clinical outcomes. So you find that actually the insurance status matters. 
The likelihood of any health care uh, also matters. And the total expenses also are different. People with free insurance uh, consume uh, more dollars. So not surprisingly, the more people had to pay for their own care, the less they used it. But the question is, were the people who used more medical care the better for it? And the answer to this question is no. Across every single measure, free care versus cost-sharing care, there was no effect on health status. So if you look at physical function, here's the cost-sharing plan and the free plan. Mental health, smoking, weight, cholesterol levels, diastolic bar blood pressure, far vision, uh, and risk of dying, there was no difference on any of those outcomes based on whether we gave you insurance or not, except for the blood pressure and the far vision. So, in the, so the, the free care had no effect on any major health habits, for example, that are associated with cardiovascular disease. And while people with free care did see the doctor more often, this did not lead to behavior change or risk factor improvement with respect to weight or smoking or cholesterol. And there was some mild improvement of hypertension, which at the population level was probably non-trivial. And there was a couple of snow and lines, so very tiny improvement in average vision based on people getting better uh, glass prescriptions. So we have to note that having insurance is not a panacea. The idea that all we have to do to fix and improve healthcare in our society is just simply provide people with insurance is wrong-headed. That's not the source of the problem, as we've been seeing for the last few weeks. There are deeper reasons why our health is the way it is in our society. And in fact, you already should have had a hint to this if you thought about the fact that the elder, elderly people in our society, those on Medicare, they already have access to plentiful health insurance via Medicare. And yet, even in those individuals, we saw all the socioeconomic stratification, health outcomes, and all the other kinds of things that we've been discussing. So access to medical care, let alone the proper use of medical care, should not be conflated with having insurance and should not be conflated with health. Totally different things. Do you have insurance? Do you see the doctor? And are you healthy? And as we've been seeing, there's not a lot of relationship between any of those three components. A more recent natural experiment addressed the same topic. Uh, this was taken from your readings. In 2008, there was something known as a Medicaid expansion in Oregon based on lottery drawings from a waiting list. And it provided another more recent way of looking at, does extending insurance here to poor people improve their health outcomes in a variety of ways? And two years after the lottery, data from over 6,000 adults who were randomly selected to be able to apply for the coverage were compared to data for roughly 6,000 adults who were not selected. And the scientists used the random assignment in the lottery to calculate the effect upon health of being assigned to Medicaid coverage. And they found limited effects on physical health, but notable effects on mental health, health care use, and financial circumstances. So this is, I think, taken from your readings. Again, if you can look at, for example, uh, the mean value of the control group, uh, and then compare uh, and then the change compared to the control group in the intervention group, which got assigned to insurance, there was some improvement in, uh, in blood pressure, but it wasn't statistically significant, unlike the Rand Health Insurance Experiment. And if you look at cholesterol, like oscillated hemoglobin, remember we talked about this for diabetes. Uh, depression, there was some improvement. Quality of life ratings, there was some improvement, but none of the other things. Uh, I'm sorry, and then there was some, not surprisingly, improvement in spending uh, amongst the people who now had um, insurance. So in short, this study showed that Medicaid coverage generated no significant improvements in measured physical health outcomes in the first two years after it was implemented. Although it did increase the use of healthcare services, raise rates of diabetes detection and management, lowered rates of depression, and reduced financial strain. And it's also unclear how persistent these effects would be. So maybe things would get better over a longer time horizon, or maybe worse. Maybe these effects would extinguish uh, as time went by. Again, as we have repeatedly seen. So let's consider some illustrative examples to supplement those we've been seeing earlier in the course of policy directions. So that's a little quick discussion of insurance in our society. That's the kind of more dry part of the talk today. And I wanted, you know, I couldn't spend a whole semester talking about health and healthcare in the United States and say nothing about contemporary developments in healthcare. So let's transition a little bit now to some a diverse set of illustrations of other sorts of policy maneuvers, many of which were highlighted in your readings for today. And these types of policy options typically fall in a number of categories. There's issues of money, funding, payment, and spending. How do we, you know, how do we pay for things and how does that affect what happens? 
Taxation, we can affect people's behavior by taxing them. Legislation, we can pass laws that restrain what happens to people. Education, advertising, and marketing, sort of disseminating information to affect uh, people and what, they, um, and what they do. Network and community-based interventions, and finally nudges, which was a sort of an idea that was slated for today. So we've seen illustrations of many of these ideas before. Let's revisit some of these topics. How might financial incentives be used to improve healthcare quality, for example? What might be done to achieve this desirable objective? Well, perhaps we could align incentives between providers and payers and patients uh, in sort of in, by returning money uh, to patients. So maybe here the idea is, OK, patients will only pay the healthcare system uh, for the healthcare they get if the healthcare works. So I treat you. If I get better, I pay you. If I don't get better, I don't pay you. And this is an old idea, actually. Uh, so for example, feel better or your money back is an old patent medicine. Actually, it's bromo seltzer. Uh, and it says, all headaches instantly cured or money refunded, legal guarantee. Uh, and it goes on to say, look, take this medicine. If your headache doesn't get better, uh, we'll pay you. In fact, people uh, for years were able to give and make money off of these guarantees because most people get better from their health problems anyway. Uh, so there was very low likelihood that they would be called up to return their money. But the core idea of paying for quality, as some have advocated, carried to its logical extreme is that we only pay for success. So there's a big debate right now in policy circles in our country about how can we align spending by insurers to only pay for good quality care or to enhance the care that is delivered. So why not pay people for quality or in the limit, only pay them for success? And believe it or not, this idea is very old. Here's a contract between a patient and a doctor from Genoa from almost 1,000 years ago. This is from 1244. In the name of the Lord, amen. I, Rogerio de Bruc of Begamo, promise and agree with you, Basso the wool carter, to return you to health and to make you improve from the illness that you have in your person, that is, in your hand, foot, and mouth, in good faith, with the help of God, within the next month and a half, in such a way that you will be able to feed yourself with your hand and cut bread and wear shoes and walk and speak much better than you do now. I shall take care of all the expenses that will be necessary for this, and at that time you shall pay me seven Genoese lira, and you shall not eat any fruit, beef, pasta, whether boiled or dry, or cabbage. If I do not keep my promises to you, you will not have to give me anything. And I, the aforementioned Basso, promise to you, Rogerio, to pay you seven Genoese lira within three days after my recovery and improvement. They made a contract. Actually, I think this person probably was suffering from a stroke, maybe a mild stroke. Usually those don't recover within six weeks, but sometimes people get a lot better. Maybe especially if they're taking well, get good, get good nursing care, it might have some uh, effect. And here's some more recent examples from a very broad range of condition, of sort of the no cure, no pay policy. In 1994, Merck offered refunds to patients who had been prescribed finasteride if they required surgery for benign prostatic hyperplasia after a year of treatment. In 1995, Sandoz introduced a money-back guarantee for clozapine for treatment of resistant schizophrenia. In 1998, Merck promised to refund prescription costs if simvastatin plus diet did not help lower LDL cholesterol to target concentrations identified by doctors. In 2004, Novartis launched a no-cure, no-pay initiative for Valsartan for hypertension in the US and Denmark. In 04, Lilly launched a no cure, no pay for uh, tadalafil, tadalafil for erectile dysfunction in the United States, and patients who were not satisfied with the treatment were issued with a voucher for the oral treatment of their choice. Uh, and in 2005, Bayer launched a no cure, no pay initiative on another uh, anti uh, erectile dysfunction drug uh, in Denmark. So there are a number of people or, or drug companies and others who are experimenting with this idea. And advocates for this have suggested ways of evaluating the good circumstances for this policy. So where might we use this way of aligning monetary incentives to maximize the quality of care and the optimality of the care that is delivered uh, to patients? First of all, uh, venues in which simple methods can be used to measure the effect, for example, blood tests. Or second, where the patient or general practitioner can see the effect for themselves. For example, did the patient stop smoking? Is erectile dysfunction gone? Are infections healed? What about baldness? Uh, and so forth. You can look and see it, and you pay if it works. Otherwise, you don't. And this idea continues to get attention. For example, very recently, Bluebird Pharmaceuticals has suggested charging for its gene therapy for thalassemia in this way. It says, look, 
If you are born for thalassemia, we'll give you this very high-tech, very expensive gene therapy in which we use vectors to transfect your own autologous cells so that you start making normal hemoglobin. You'll pay us $1 million, but only if we fix your thalassemia. Otherwise, we take up the costs. That, that proposal is just afoot right now as a way of treating of these kinds of conditions. Now, I don't think this idea is likely to be implemented on any kind of meaningful scale, at least not yet. But I do think it's very rational, and I think it would work. And in any case, it's very provocative to think about how we would go about implementing these types of ideas. And there may be elements of this idea, such as paying for quality of care, that would be worth implementing more broadly. Another idea to improve medical care is to pass more laws regulating the actual practice of medicine or patients' interactions with the healthcare system. And the key idea here is that laws might be used to affect health and healthcare. And we've seen some examples of this earlier in the domain of tobacco and, uh, and seatbelt use. And the issues are different, of course, when we're trying to legislate certain kinds of behaviors in doctors rather than in patients. So for example, the laws regulating how doctors care for their patients are relatively uncommon, um, except for laws regulating the practice of research. So for example, there are laws in this country that regulate how doctors do things like vaccinate children, uh, report mammograms, uh, you know, if a patient has mammography, the doctor is required by law to tell the patient these results. Uh, reporting infectious diseases to authorities, if you have an infectious disease, the doctor has to act in a certain way. Or providing information with respect to advanced directives near the end of life, or breast cancer treatment options, and so forth. And this is a complicated area, given long-standing concerns with pre preserving uh, physician professionalism. Because we want doctors to feel moral responsibility we want them to feel themselves responsible for what they're doing. And we want to encourage them to do that, perhaps with legislation. But we also want them to exercise judgment and discretion. Uh, so we don't necessarily want to constrain them too much. And it's an endless and difficult balance uh, to strike. But nevertheless, the law can be a very effective policy tool. Making information more widely available is another possibly low-cost way of improving health. And the internet is doing just that. And as a result, it's leading to radical changes in the doctor-patient relationship. So this data, these are old data. But the idea here is, well, what about strategies that disseminate information and through a variety of means and educate people? How can we use that as a policy lever to improve health and health care in our society? 40% uh, of people with internet access use it to get health information. 48% of those with chronic illness felt the internet use improved their understanding. 27% of those with a chronic illness felt that the internet improved their ability to manage their condition by themselves. And more and more, we're seeing online tools and apps being developed, many by young people such as yourselves, that make it easier for people to take control of their own health care. So cancer patients sharing information about chemotherapeutic side effects, or diabetic patients, just like it's Airbnb, basically, for, um, for chemotherapy. So people can kind of exchange information in a kind of wiki fashion uh, with each other. And this has resulted in a number of changes in the healthcare relationship. Patients come into the office with more knowledge. They can gather experiences and interact with other patients all over the world. They can get non-medical perspectives on their treatments and second-guess their providers. And they can band together to advocate politically uh, for their uh, interests and to change practice. And in fact, the, uh, the elderly, the population of elderly who have, are now familiar with the internet that's going to age into being older than 65 is going to swell dramatically in the coming 10 or so years. And these individuals will, for a variety of reasons, including increased access to medical information, a diverse set of patients' rights movements, for example, the Right to Die movement, and the consumer choice movement, bring increasing sophistication to their healthcare and counters. And in fact, some have argued that this will, quote, accelerate the movement and awareness of self-care and wellness and will irreversibly alter the traditional doctor-patient relationship. So very ironically, returning to an idea we introduced at the beginning of the course when we were talking about illage, this type of modern communication, which is facilitating interactions by patients, actually is going to help fulfill a kind of illichian idea of subverting the power of doctors. By moving the power into the hands of patients, it's going to tip the balance in exactly the kind of way that Illich wanted. 
The internet may help us realize the Illichian vision of putting health and health information in the hands of people rather than in the hands of some kind of professional class. Other policies we might implement might direct themselves to patients rather than to doctors. Is that, is that clear so far today? Can't wait to get to nudges, which I'll talk about in a minute. Any questions on this? Yes, what's your name again? Uh, Ruben. Ruben. I have a question that relates to um, like the scientists that uh, improve that to for health insurance, but not necessarily improve uh, quality or uh, health for um, people who are insured. But I'm wondering if any studies have done or if it's worthwhile to any studies to look at the at specific diseases that plague minority communities, for example, like diabetes, much you know, and see if higher uh, insurance levels will I think it's probably going to be possible to find some communities and some diseases for which insurance uh, it definitely helps. You know, I think certainly very expensive high intensity conditions like cancer, uh, you know, in children, I think would be, would be uh, definitely benefited from that. But you know, the main driver of health in our society is not healthcare. And uh, so getting people more access to it, which we, will, which we do want to do for justice reasons and other reasons, some people are benefited from, isn't going to solve the problem or actually address the inequities that we, that we see, or forget the inequities, although that's important, it's just the general, the suboptimal performance when it comes to health in our society. Yeah, there was another question. Yeah? Okay, so this is taken from your readings. This was a rather clever study. You could do something like this at Yale, actually. Low cost, in your, it was in your readings, low cost, very clever study. And what they did here is, is they took, it was a very simple nudge. They placed signs in a large mall, and then they hid behind some palms, and they watched how they affected nearly 18,000 shoppers over the course of three months. And they had two different signs. One sign said, your heart needs exercise, use the stairs. And the other sign said, improve your waistline, use the stairs. And what they found was that at baseline, 4.8% of the shoppers use the stairs, so most of them take the escalators or the elevator. And the uh, health benefit sign increased that to 6.9%, and the weight control sign increases 7.2%. And then they also make simple observations about the people's attributes. This was research in public. They were, were young or old, men or women. They were overweight or not, uh, and what their race was. And they can look across categories to see where the sign's more or less effective across these different sorts of categories. But in fact, in some ways, these results are almost too good to be true. Because think about the cost effectiveness of this. If each sign and easel cost about $60, it would cost less than $200,000 to place a sign at every single regional mall in the United States. And if only 4% of shoppers use the stairs each of these, in each of these malls, roughly 1.6 million more Americans would take the stairs each day than before just from putting up these little nudges. And the, lower, and the caloric content of walking up and down two flights of stairs each day, which we discussed earlier in the course, is about five calories per flight and this would amount to a weight loss of a few pounds for the average man over the course of every single year that he or she responded to this intervention. We could actually potentially make a dent in the obesity epidemic just by simple nudges, in theory, that get people to start walking up and down the stairs more instead of using um, the escalator. And this is another example of nudging advocated by Thaler and Sunstein in the readings for today and by others based on basic psychological principles. How can we take advantage of an understanding of human behavior to create, change the structure, taking into account individuals' agency, so that people will start acting better on their own accord? And sometimes these nudges are, you know, are kind of lightly paternalistic, right? We sort of say, we know what's best for you. Let's organize your environment so that you do the right thing. And they're often very ingenious. So here, uh, here's what this, you know, here it looks like Snoopy and, and Linus and Charlie Brown and so forth uh, on the crosswalk, but here's what it's like painted uh, from the side. But as you approach it, it looks like this, and it you know, makes you slow down, more effective than just the, those, uh, the, the marks. For example, you can stop, here's another way to stop gum from winding up where it doesn't belong. Give it a right place to put the gum. So for example, you know, stick your gum here, uh, you know, which, which actor was not in Ocean's Eleven? Uh, and then it'd be something to Matt Damon's nose. Or stick your gum here if you love Marmite or hate Marmite. Raise your hands if you love Marmite. A four. Raise your hands if you hate Marmite. Raise your hands if you don't know what Marmite is. 
<laughs> it's a really foul smelling yeast extract that unaccountably the British love. And it's totally different than the, than the Vegemite. It's like, it's hard to describe. It's a very pungent, gross <laughs> spread that they like. <laughs> I don't know why. My wife likes Marmite. Anyway, uh, you can, uh, but you can, uh, you can, you know, you would stick the uh, the gum uh, in that location. And nudges often exploit social pressure. So here's an example: take your litter home. Other people do. And this exploitation of kind of social norming effect can actually be very, very powerful. So if you've stayed at a hotel recently, you may have noticed the little signs in the bathroom where the hotel says, you know, recycle the towels because save the world. You know. Uh, it's a good idea, right? Have you seen these, these little announcements in the moment? Actually, the hotels initially resisted those uh, because they thought it was like going to make their guests upset. And then they realized that actually, not only could they ostensibly improve the environment, but they could save a ton of money by doing that. So then they suddenly said, oh, we're, we love the environment. Let's put, uh, let's put these, uh, these signs in the bathrooms. And they did. But then they discovered that actually another kind of sign was even more effective than save the environment. If they put in signs in the, ba in the bathroom that said, 70% of users of this room in the past have recycled their towels. That was a really powerful message to get people to recycle. A kind of explicit benchmarking with what their peers might be doing. And sometimes social pressure can involve threats. Here's a sign that says no urination. And here's a little explanation of further steps that will be taken. It will be filmed and then step one, your B, step two, it's only and then it's put on YouTube. Uh, for everyone to see you do your business if you piss on this wall. Um, and, you know, I think that is a very effective nudge that, you know, maybe, I don't know, we don't have a problem with public urination so much at Yale, I don't think, but that could be effective. Here's a, a way to incentivize staying on target. So, raise your hands if you've been in a really gross men's room. <laughs> yeah, so guys don't have a lot of aim oftentimes. So giving them a little target actually can really help uh, with their aim, kind of make a game out of, out of, uh, out of successfully doing this, uh, actually can greatly reduce cleaning costs and improve hygiene in public restrooms. Or if you really want to improve hygiene in public restrooms, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this one dates back to when Napoleon was in power, a little uh, chamber pot with the emperor uh, uh, cast into the bottom of the pot so that you can piss on him. Uh, if you're trying to change ideas, for example, the, the equivalent today might be to put a, a political figure into the bottom of a urinal to try to change people's ideas about what was happening. Uh, and here's another kind of, I think, futile effort uh, to try to nudge men into hand washing, which is to redesign the sink so there's a com combo urinal sink. <laughs> <laughs> which strikes me as totally absurd. I mean, I mean, how can the guys be expected to like nail it here? They're going to piss in the sink is what's going to happen. <laughs> But maybe as well, you stand here, you pee there, and then you lean forward and wash your hands. I mean, one stop shopping, you really drive home the point you need to wash your hands uh, before you leave the bathroom. But I think that this is just on the faucet, so it's going to create more problems than it uh, leaves. And this one is not so subtle. It was an advertisement for Atabrine, an anti malaria drug uh, in Papua New Guinea during the Second World War. Putting the skulls there, these men did <laughs> take their Atabrine, you know kind of a little nudge uh, to take your uh, medication. And nudges need to be thrown through carefully, however, to avoid unintended side effects. So this was noted, the, the fail here was noted by a, a middle school student when the school district issued these, uh, these pencils, too cool to do drugs. But of course, it's a charge. It's cool to do drugs, do drugs, or just drugs, uh, as, you sharpen, as you sharpen the pencil. So. Um, so, uh, you know, this was immediately discarded as soon as this 11-year-old pointed this out uh, to, the, uh, to the school district. And here's an inventive example from Sweden, uh, similar in intent uh, with respect to the placard. Some of you have probably seen this before. It made the rounds on the internet a few years ago. But let me just, oh, let me put this, let me uh, plug this in. Um, where's the uh, sound?
corporations, but they're pretty inventive, actually. <laughs> um, but you can see how you can begin to imagine redesigning public places in a way that nudges people to make healthier choices uh, about you know, what they're doing. So that's an idea, Gianna. Yeah, it could. And I mean, in principle, you could do, like here, we talked a little bit about in the article for today, you could, in principle, look at whether young people were more sensitive or not. I actually haven't looked at these results in a while, so I don't remember. So, for example. Yeah, I, yeah, but I'm just saying age could affect the response. That's right. And you would need different ages, different nudges from different ages to get people uh, to behave better. So, yeah, it looks like in this one, for example, the younger people are more likely to respond than the older people. So absolutely, they could be stratified according to age or all kinds of other things. And obviously, if I was trying to design something to get you guys to behave in some particular way, whatever that might be, uh, it would have to be different than if I was designing it to get the faculty to behave uh, in a different way. I should have put, I need to make a note of myself to do that next year, to put the, uh, uh, you guys, who, which of you here saw the, uh, the photograph of uh, President Salve uh, on the Abbey Road uh, photograph in the crosswalk at the beginning of the year. Raise your hands if you didn't see it. So not only, it's a really funny image that shows uh, Chief Higgins and Salovey and Ben Pollock. I forgot who the fourth figure is. There are four of them, bare feet, dressed like the Beatles, walking across the crosswalk to try to get Gaelics when they first arrive here to pay attention when you're crossing the street and not you know, be hit by a car. So you know, that kind of a design might be, let's say, more optimal uh, than for some than for others. So there are many ways you can begin to think about doing that. Uh, for example, I think Yale Dining Halls, are they trailless right now? Are all Yale Dining Halls trailless or just some? Just some. I think Silliman is trailless, as I remember. I was just in Silliman. Uh, so, yay. Uh, but, um, but, you know, why? What's the reason to have, uh, uh, what are the benefits for having trailless uh, dining halls? Raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, you grab most of it at a time, and so uh, you can grab more food. Yeah, so it's a nudging way to stop you from taking as much food, right? So you can't, you have to carry your drink in one hand and your plate in the other. You don't have like multiple drinks, multiple plates of food and so forth. That's exactly right. Other reasons it's beneficial to go trailless? Yeah, in the back. You don't have to wash trays. Yeah, you don't have to wash a tray. So there are other savings. But the real savings is in the decrease in food wastage. Uh, and and so, so yeah, so this is a little, that's a nudge. We take the trays away from the dining hall. We don't tell you what to eat. We don't come and say, you need to eat this or you shouldn't do that. We just remove the trays from the dining hall, and that has some effect on you. Other ideas you could implement at this college level would depend on what it is that you're trying to incentivize or trying to modify. Here's an example of how the built environment is ridiculous. Uh, these guys are going to work out at 24-hour fitness, and they're not even walking up the slight of stairs, you know, they're taking the escalator off uh, to go presumably work out. And if you think about how we have changed our environment, how we've used fossil fuels to make it possible for us to do really trivial things uh, with someone else expending energy, it's, it's pretty um, astonishing. And as we saw earlier in the course, even a slight increase or decrease in the average caloric intake or energy expenditure could have huge population level effects. This figure shows the median of the distribution of estimated energy accumulation that accounts for the observed weight gain of about two pounds per American uh, age 20 to 40 uh, in the last two years. So it's about 15 kilocalories per day, or just a, flight of, a few flights of stairs as we've been discussing. So these nudges, if they were effective, and if people didn't extinguish, if people kept responding to them, actually we could reshape by modifying the structure of the environment in which we live and changing people's behavior in ways that are not so dictatorial or dogmatic, actually could maybe uh, make significant inroads into the obesity epidemic. So signs and the environmental nudges uh, might work, and this might sound too optimistic because people do eventually adapt to these signs and come to ignore them, for example, like cigarette labels. So eventually the power of the cigarette labels still is there, but it's declined dramatically from when they were first introduced, when you get a big shock of decline and so forth. Eventually people get used to the labels and they're not, they don't have the same um, impact.
Or, in another thing that was assigned from the meetings today, instead of paying doctors or relying on simple or cheap nudges, maybe we could actually pay patients. Now, this runs against what we think of in the United States. You know, we think of people having moral agency. We're so interested in your agency and making free choices and in your liberty, which is great. I don't object to it. But we think it's ridiculous. Why should I pay you to take better care of your health? Well, actually, getting you to quit smoking saves the whole society dollars, makes you a more productive worker, and imposes fewer burdens on me from secondhand tobacco smoke. Actually, it might be quite rational to pay you to quit smoking. Not only might it be effective in getting you to quit, but it might be socially efficient as well. And these are the results from a randomized controlled trial that was in your reading, in which a $750 incentive was paid to people to get them to quit smoking. And so if you look at the study group versus the, uh, the control group, uh, people who were given uh, the incentive were, nearly, were more than three times as likely uh, to quit smoking. So giving people an incentive of 750 bucks really gets them to change their behavior. What's very weird to me about a lot of these things is we are such a capitalist society, and we believe so much that money makes a difference in the choices that people make. For instance, in whether what careers you guys pick, or what products people buy. We manipulate price to affect people's purchasing behavior for all kinds of things all the time. And yet, when it comes to the idea of actually manipulating money to change behavior, for example, let's pay teachers more. We'll get better teachers. You know, all this debate about the problems with early learning in the United States, people always want to say, well, let's test the students, and let's really have more rules for the teachers. No, let's just double their salaries and recruit better people uh, to the profession. Oh, no, that would be too expensive. Suddenly, now, when it comes to spending money on social goods, then all of a sudden we draw the line. Well, the same holds with things like health care. Actually, we can pay people to behave in ways that is beneficial to themselves and, importantly, to others. And we shouldn't be shocked or surprised that this works. And such experiments, we've seen a couple of experiments today. You saw the Volp experiment, and you saw the Anderson sign experiment, where they put up the signs. And others, for example, you saw the neighborhood broken windows experiment a few weeks ago, uh, and, and others over the course offer many benefits. So one of the other kind of themes in the class that's been running throughout the class is periodically we've been seeing the difference between observational studies and experimental social science uh, of the kind that you had at least a couple of papers today. And there are a number of benefits to these types of experiments. First of all, when you randomize assignment of people, you can to control and treatment groups, this eliminates forms of bias such as confounding and selection that have been sort of bedeviling some of the other work that we've been reviewing. If I can really randomly assign you guys to get the, you know, the smoking intervention and you guys not to get it, I can really powerfully measure whether or not it's the smoking intervention achieves the objective in a way that I couldn't if I just had you volunteer for the smoking intervention. Because maybe those of you who volunteer were more powerfully motivated to quit smoking so it wasn't the intervention that got you to quit, it was the fact that you volunteered and had this motivation that got you to quit. And in fact, randomized trials of this kind, experiments, allow investigators to study cause and effect relationships much more robustly and confidently. And it allows uh, the examination of the efficacy of a specific intervention, meaning that they can be very useful for forming social policy. So oftentimes, when we implement social policies, we do something to make the world different. You know, we, uh, we uh, have an advertising campaign, or we pass a law sometimes, and it changes many different things. So it's hard to know 